All right, guys, we're back home. Um, we just got back from Florida. We were at a race uh, down in Gainesville, uh, one, of, one of the races that we uh, have gone to many times and have always had a good time at. And um, on the way home, we were traveling up I-95. Well, they stole, um, some people came in the night and they stole my, my truck and my trailer and um, like one of my most prized possessions, uh, my, my 1962 Studebaker Lark that um, my dad and my mom bought me when I was 16 and uh, we built, uh, you know, we built for me. Um, I'm sorry if I'm not my usual uh, amount of energy. Um, I feel uh, like I feel like I've been really just beaten down. Um, this this really sucks. Um, so let me let me just take you through what happened. Um, so we were racing down in Florida, and they uh, had the award ceremony, and the event sort of ended around 4 p.m. And uh, being from Pennsylvania, we wanted to get home uh, within a reasonable amount of time. So we pretty much left at 4 p.m. and started traveling north. And we figured we would get so far, get a hotel, and uh, travel the rest of the way home on Monday. And we pushed forward and we made it to the hotel on Sunday around midnight on April 7th, 2024. When we arrived at the hotel, there was plenty of space for uh, both my dad and I to park our trucks and trailers, um, but my dad was trying to uh, make a spot near a, uh, a light uh, to park both trucks and trailers, but there was another open spot that was sort of near where he was parked, and I was just so tired. I just wanted to go to bed, and I decided instead of, you know, waiting for him to park and have me park next to him so that, you know, if somebody tried to steal our stuff, uh, it would be harder for them. Um, you know, I was just going to park in the other spot that was nearby um, and, you know, go to bed. This right here, this, this was a huge mistake. And it, it really cost me... Um, you know, it should have cost me. I, I didn't do anything wrong. I, I just was parking my truck in a parking lot. That's not illegal. There's no reason I should have been penalized by that, but I was. Now, when I got out of my truck, I was grabbing my luggage and um, I was looking at the other stuff that I had in my truck, such as a, a couple laptop computers and a, a bunch of camera equipment. And I was thinking, the camera equipment and the laptop, they'll be fine for one night. Normally I take them into the hotel with me, but it's just one night. They'll be okay. I'm so tired. I want to go to bed. They'll be okay. Well, that didn't work out so well. I pretty much headed straight for bed but my dad stopped to talk to the hotel staff just to see, you know, do you have cameras out in the parking lot um, and, you know, that kind of thing. And what they said to him was, oh yeah, yeah, we got cameras, but nobody would come out this far to steal anything. Turns out they were wrong. So I pretty quickly went to bed and I woke up to my phone ringing at around 6.20 a.m. to my dad uh, pretty frantically uh, asking me, where did you park your truck? And I said, well, I parked it in the back of the hotel. You know, let me get dressed real quick and I'll come down and, and we'll find it. So I did that and I went down stairs and it was gone. Um, the spot where I had parked it, there were two other vehicles parked um, and, you know, it, it was gone. After that, we called the police and we asked to see the camera footage. And they said, oh, well, we have to have a manager in here in order to access the cameras. 
So we, we sat and we waited for the police to show up while I dug up pictures of my possessions so that I could make a Facebook post and see if anybody could, uh, you know, find it for me or, you know, at least tell me where it is. And we had to sit there for a really long time and finally the manager showed up and she informed us that they do not have any cameras. So that was, that was cool. Um, and then the cop showed up, uh, he asked for our information, we gave it to him, and he said he would pass it along. Um, but, you know, he didn't really seem very uh, interested in helping us too much. But I, I guess it's a common thing down there, so, you know, it's probably a pretty mundane thing for him. So from this point, it was kind of like, okay, now what? From here, we decided to pack up. I hopped into my dad's truck and trailer, and we headed for home. So next, let's talk about what they stole from me. So I was traveling in a 2006 green Ford F-250 Super Duty uh, with a six liter power stroke. This was the first brand new truck that my dad had ever bought, and uh, I bought it from him uh, when I graduated college to uh, sort of be my tow rig, and he bought another brand new truck. The, the truck worked great, it, it towed really well, it was beginning to get a little bit rusty, but you know, the thing functioned awesome, and it was a great truck. And also, we had some stuff inside of the truck, as I mentioned earlier, my laptop and some of my camera equipment was inside of the truck, that will probably get pawned off and, um, you know, sold for uh, a very low amount of money so that people don't ask questions. Um, they'll probably wonder why, why is the username Calvin? Who could that be? Also, in the back seat of the truck, there was uh, every single t-shirt that we have available to sell. We were hoping to sell some t-shirts down in Florida. We didn't sell too many, which, you know, it's all good. Um, but uh, there was probably about $6,000 worth of t-shirts sitting in the back of the truck. Moving on to the bed, uh, there was um, there was my wheels for, for my Studebaker uh, that I, I, I had always wanted. I always wanted a set of torque thrusts uh, for my, my Studebaker and I finally bought myself a set and um, those were stolen. So next let's move on to the trailer. Um, the trailer was a white enclosed trailer. It was fairly plain looking but one of the main distinguishers uh, for it was uh, it had the numbers 9270 in the upper left hand corner of the uh, the, the door in the back. Um, that was my dad's racing number for when uh, he land speed raced. That trailer has been all over the country. It has way over a hundred thousand miles on it and you know I have a lot of memories with that trailer. That was that that was the uh, first enclosed trailer that my dad bought. He had built ones in the past, but this was the first like actual legitimate enclosed trailer that he he had bought. And that that trailer was full of tools. Um, there was a bunch of uh, tools that we used to work on our cars, as well as a bunch of my drag week uh, supplies that I normally put in cars to uh, go on drag and drives. Um, all of my sockets and wrenches and all that kind of stuff, they were in the, in the trailer, as well as all, every bit of wiring supplies that I own, bunch of spare parts, uh, carburetors and ignition boxes and distributors and, you know, all kinds of stuff spare tires for the trailer, you know, there was a nice winch in there, um, we had a come along in there, you know, just a bunch of other bits and bobs. But the most important thing, at least to me, in the trailer was my 1962 Studebaker Lark. This car was 
my favorite car. If you were to ask me, like, you know, if you had to sell everything else except for one thing, what would it be? It would be this car. This car was my, my first car. Um, I, my dad and my mom bought it for me when I was 16. And we, we built the thing, fixed the thing, customized the thing to be one heck of a cool hot rod. And we have so much time into that car. And, and I'll briefly go over, you know, some of the recent things that we had done. Um, we had just recently installed an Explorer 8.8 .8 with a 33 spline spool and a set of aftermarket axles in the back to uh, basically make the diff bomb proof. We had just got done converting the transmission setup into a TKX 5 speed. It was a brand new transmission. Uh, I, I paid like $5,500 for all of the uh, transmission and associated parts for the conversion. Uh, I installed a, a L83 into the front. I probably had around $2,000 in that whole setup. And one of the staples of that whole thing was the 180 degree headers that I had built for the car. It was all made out of inch and three quarter stainless tubing. Um, and I had well over 100 hours into building those headers. Um, I was really happy with how they came out. I, you know, I went the extra mile and everything. And, um, you know, they're probably going to light them on fire or junk them or something. So probably never see those again. Um, also, I had a Holley Dominator on the car with a Holley 7-inch display that uh, Matt Happel helped me out with. Um, and I, I had spent probably close to 150 hours wire, totally rewiring the car uh, because the original electronics were just junk in the car um, you know basically every bit of wire in that car was new and I had touched every inch of it and the thieves are probably gonna just cut tear and slice all of that hard work the last thing that we had done to the car was we had just installed an LT4 supercharger setup onto the top of the engine. I had probably 30-40 hours into uh, this conversion as well as you know probably close to $3,000 in all the associated parts and um, that kind of thing, maybe even close to $4,000. And I was super excited with how everything had turned out. The car was just spot on. Like, I wouldn't change a thing about it. But now it is gone. So let's talk about the aftermath of the whole incident and the likely outcomes. So the car was probably stolen shortly after we arrived at the hotel. And um, apparently this is sort of a common thing that happens down south in North and South Carolina. They target F-250s uh, because they are infamously extremely easy to steal. So sometime, probably while it was still dark, the truck was moved from the hotel to another secure location. And a friend of ours who is a cop sort of told us how this whole situation generally plays out. So the, the thieves will move the truck and trailer to a location where it's, it's not visible from the road. And they will just park it there. Then they will wait for somebody to come and get it. And, uh, you know, obviously if someone comes get it, they had a tracking system on it. And, you know, they weren't going to get away with it anyways. So they let the truck and trailer sit there for a few days. Then if the truck doesn't move, then they assume it's not being tracked. And then 
they start to do the dirty work. The truck will uh, have the VIN number scraped off of it, and that VIN number will be replaced with a new one. The trailer will have its VIN number removed from it, and they will reclassify the trailer as a home built. And then they will try to sell those things uh, back into uh, the market, and um, no one will be none the wiser. As for the possessions that we had in the truck, they will sell anything of value. Um, and then, you know, all of our t-shirts and that kind of thing will probably get burned or thrown in the garbage. As for my race car, that is a liability for them. Thieves, thieves are dumb. Um, they, they, they've obviously chosen to be thieves, so they're not very smart. So, we could hope that maybe they'll, they'll just get rid of the car, they'll be like, hey, this car is, is really identifiable, like, we're not going to get away with just, like, throwing a coat of paint on the thing and, you know, removing the VIN tag. Um, this thing, you know, we need to just get rid of this thing. So, if there's a possibility that it might end up on the side of the road somewhere and, um, you know, maybe we'll get the thing back. But I think the more likely outcome is they will have seen the t-shirts in the back seat of my truck and then they will see the Nivlac 57 tag on you know over 200 t-shirts sitting in the back of the truck and then they're gonna go oh crap what did we just do then they'll get their phones out they'll start googling and then they're gonna they're gonna end up here and then they're going to go, uh-oh, we have an angry mob coming after us. Um, I appreciate everybody that is out there trying to help us find our stuff. Um, and please continue to do so. But, you know, this is also probably going to freak them out. So then they're going to be like, uh, okay, let me call my uh, Uncle Bill, who's a meth addict, who has been in and out of prison for most of his life and uh, uh, we need to get rid of this thing quick. And then they'll break out the gasoline and the torches and they will burn it to the ground or they'll carve the thing up into a billion pieces and stick it into random dumpsters all across town. Or maybe they'll just push it into a lake and you know call it a day. And this really, really hurts. Um, we had a lot of time and energy into building that car and it was to a point where I was very very happy with it. The last pass that I made with the car was like one of the best passes I've ever made in the car and I was super happy with how everything was performing and we were finally getting the car sorted in and I'll probably never see it again. You know, it really, it really sucks because, you know, of everything they stole from me, that's the only thing that has any value to me. And it has absolutely no value to them. They were probably hoping to open up the trailer and see a 69 Camaro that is matching numbers and has all the stuff. But no, they open the box and it's some stupid Studebaker that some idiot up north built. A little over a year ago, my dad was in a catastrophic racing accident and he nearly died. Now, I, I apologize, guys. I, I just got a vent here. Like, you know, that, that was a huge setback. Like, it, just the mental stuff that I had to go through and you know just just getting the confidence back and you know frankly you know this race down in florida this was the first fast pass that my dad had made since the accident and i was a mental wreck you know i was just breaking into tears the whole day and just going through you know all i could see was that little red car flipping and lighting on fire with my dad inside and you know, it, it, I finally, I was able to get through that, and he made a pass, and it was clean, and, you know, everything was good. 
And then on the way home, it's like, let's let's throw some more trauma into your life. Let's let's just make it a little bit harder for you to sleep at night. And it's like, you know, I, I try to be a good person. I try to help as many people as I can. I try to, you know, I spend so much time trying to help you guys make your dreams come true. And, you know, try to put out a positive message and, you know, spread as much joy as I can. And, you know, it's like I don't have any skeletons in my closet. I'm just a regular guy who's trying to put out some positive information and, and just make people happy. And it's like, you know, I just can't win. It's like I'm just about to start to have fun. You know, it was like the most fun I've ever had in a car. You know, it was the first time I had ever raced something where I couldn't wait to make another pass. But, you know, I have to look at it from, a, you know, as good of a perspective as I can. You know, we made it home. Nobody's hurt. Nobody died. You know, it, it, it sucks. But, you know, my family's okay. Um, you know, my house didn't burn down. You know, it's, we're okay. You know, it's, it's just a car. It's, you know, it was a special car to me, but it's just a car. So next, I, I want to just, I want to make these, these, uh, I want to make their lives as difficult as I can. So let me go through my truck and describe it in very explicit detail. My truck is a green Ford F-250. It had around 166,000 miles on it. It had a six liter power stroke. It had the red tag on the engine, which is actually the better one that you want. I had installed a aftermarket alternator onto the, uh, the engine and the turbo was pretty much brand new. Um, you'll know that it is mine because there are, is uh, some heavy cabling going from the alternator to both batteries on either side. The interior is tan cloth interior. The driver's side uh, seat has a, a sort of a hole worn into it uh, from climbing in and out. Um, and I installed an aftermarket navigation system into the dash. And um, if you pop the fuse panel, you'll see that uh, the way that I wired up the backup camera, I pulled one of the fuses out and then I stripped the wire and then I sort of just wrapped it around the fuse and then jammed it back up in there. So if you see that, that was probably me. The whole frame of the truck was beginning to rust uh, pretty bad. Um, I had Rancho shocks on the truck all the way around and they were also getting pretty rusty as well. Um, the bed of the truck, the, uh, the horizontal slats in the bed were starting to get pretty bad. Like you could like peel the rust out of the slats of those, uh, the, the bed. So uh, if you see a truck that looks pretty rusty for a truck that is down south, start, you know, setting flags off in your head and maybe send me uh, a link on Facebook and I can tell you if it was mine. Next let's talk about the trailer. It is a steel frame JNLS uh, white enclosed trailer. Uh, I'm not saying they can't paint it obviously. Um, it was a dual leaf spring setup in the rear with a, a sort of a middle shackle. Um, we had just had everything replaced all new leaf springs, all new bearings, gone over the brakes, new shackles, new bolts, uh, new everything. The thing was ready for another 100,000 miles and um, it was an excellent towing trailer. We had just put four brand new tires onto it. Um, the, I think three of the four trailer tires were white and there was one gray one if I remember right. I might be wrong on that one. And if they are dumb enough to leave our racing number on the rear gate, look for 9270, upper left-hand corner. The interior, it was a plywood floor that was painted gray. It was fairly used. It, you know, had had a lot of cars in and out of it. I forget what brand toolboxes were inside of the trailer, but the one was the kind where you had like the shutter that went up and down in the uh, toolbox. 
to help the drawers from opening and closing. And the other one was sort of a, a mid-height uh, toolbox with another box on top of it. And hopefully that describes it in enough detail that um, you can identify it. As for my Studebaker, I doubt they'll be dumb enough to try and just sell the thing as is. Uh, obviously the thing is extremely identifiable, uh, but you know, if you see something that looks like mine that's been painted in another color, and they're dumb enough to be trying to sell it, um, you know, let me know. Um, also, they will likely strip the car down. That car was assembled with a great amount of care, and stuff is a little bit of a puzzle to uh, assemble and take apart. Um, so they will likely hack and slash and tear and and destroy all of my hard work that I put into the car. Um, so they will probably peel everything of value out of the thing, um, such as the, the ECU. Obviously, Holly Dominators are not cheap. Um, they will probably take all of my wiring that I spent so much time setting up at the firewall and they will take a big chopper and they'll just cut it off right there at the firewall and then they'll tear the engine out you know they probably won't do it properly you know the the engine had a motor plate with a removable cross member in the rear to you know help tilt the engine and pull it out but if you see a tkx and they are dumb enough to leave the hanlon motorsports sticker on that uh, transmission setup uh, and a quick time bell, house, bell housing um, that's that's with it or you know sold by the same seller or whatever um, you know down there in the south and it looks like it's it's unreasonably cheap it's probably mine as for the engine, if they're dumb enough to leave the blue valve covers on it, that is an excellent way to identify it. And also look for supercharger, uh, LT4 supercharger conversion parts. I had to modify the supercharger by installing the aftermarket drive hub with the uh, pulley that's set up for truck accessories, as well as I had to modify the snout section to clear the truck accessories. So if you see the little uh, thing that sticks down in the front if it's ground off and then it, there's a plate welded in there that's my supercharger also look for the adapter plates i had just installed those port injectors if you see them uh, please like let me know or I, I don't know maybe call the cops as for the headers uh, <laughs> they will not be able to sell those things without somebody going hey are these your headers so I'm sorry to be such a downer. Um, I just wanted to tell you guys what happened, and I'm gonna we're gonna push through this. Um, we just gotta, you know, keep keep going. Um, hopefully, we'll have more Camaro content for you guys very soon, as well as uh, some more North Star content. I gotta deal with the insurance company and see if they're gonna give me any money for anything, and you know that kind of stuff. But. <sighs> we'll get through it it's you know it is what it is it's uh it was a car you know I, nobody was hurt we're gonna be okay it's not like you know i had my life savings tied up into this thing you know uh, we'll recover we'll get through it it just sucks so with that i'm gonna end this video off here and uh, thanks to everybody out there who has been uh, trying to help find it and trying to, you know, offer any words of encouragement or anything like that. Um, so, all right, see you guys. Mm -hmm.